Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the CUNY Graduate Center. My name is Teresita Levy, and I am the Associate Director of the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies here at the Graduate Center. Um, our center's mission is to bring together scholars throughout the CUNY system and, on th and other New York City universities and colleges to discuss issues relevant to the Caribbean, Latin America, and their global diasporas. Tonight's program, Puerto Rico is not Greece, U.S. colonialism, debt, and migration deals with what is the most pressing issue for Puerto Ricans both on the island and the mainland today, the paying, the restructuring, or the default of the $72 billion debt. Although Puerto Rico has been called America's Greece, this is far from true, as tonight's panelists will discuss. And it is indeed an honor to be sharing tonight with such a distinguished group of scholars, experts in Puerto Rican history, society, and culture. Ismael Garcia Colon is an associate professor of anthropology at the College of Staten Island, CUNY. He is a historical and political anthropologist with interests in political economy, migration, and Caribbean, Latin American, and Latina Latino studies. Ismael is the author of Land Reformed in Puerto Rico, Modernizing the Colonial State, 1941 to 1969, published by University Press of Florida in 2009. His research explores how development policies formed and transformed modern subjectivities in Puerto Rico during the mid-20th century. He is currently writing a book on the Puerto Rican experience in U.S. farm labor and its relation to the formation of the colonial state in Puerto Rico, the political economy of agriculture, and the discourses and practices of deportation and citizenship. Hari Franky Rivera is a historian and researcher at Centro, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, CUNY, specializing in Puerto Rican, Caribbean, and Latino history. His work addresses issues of race and gender within imperial colonial structures, nation building projects, the creation of national identities, and the impact of military institutions in society, culture, and politics. He is currently revising a manuscript for publication by Nebraska University Press entitled, Fighting for the Nation, Military Service, and Modern Puerto Rican National Identities. He is also finishing a second manuscript on the experience of the 65 de Infanteria during the Korean War. His recent work includes so a new day has dawned for Puerto Rico's Hibaro, military service, manhood, and self-government during World War I in Latino studies, national mythologies, U.S. citizenship for the people of Puerto Rico and military service, published by Memorias, and Puerto Rican veterans and service members' well-being and place within the diaspora, a chapter in Puerto Ricans at the dawn of the millennium. Most recently, he has engaged as a public intellectual and published articles in Centro Voices, Ochenta Grados, Latino Rebels, and the Huffington Post, dealing with issues from Puerto Rican identity, immigration, and the diaspora, to the condition of Puerto Rican veterans and the economic crisis. There are plenty of seats right here in the front, so feel free to join us. Hector Cordero Guzman is an applied sociologist and professor of research methods, social policy, and nonprofit management in the School of Public Affairs at Baruch College of the City University of New York. He is also the co principal investigator in Human Services Research Partnerships, Puerto Rico, at Inter American University, and a professor in the PhD programs in sociology and in urban education at the CUNY Graduate Center. Prior to joining the School of Public Affairs at CUNY, Hector worked as a program officer in the Economic Development and the Quality Employment Units of the Asset Building and Community Development Program at the Ford Foundation. He received his MA and PhD degrees in sociology from the University of Chicago. Finally, our fourth panelist, Edwin Melendez, who is the director of Centro at Hunter College, could not be with us tonight. Um, he was asked by Governor Cuomo's office to join their delegation to Puerto Rico. He is there tonight, and he apologized for not, apologizes for not being able to join us. But I suppose when Governor Cuomo calls, you answer, right? Um, and finally, let me just say that the community of scholars of Puerto Rico is relatively small, and it is really a great, great pleasure to be surrounded by respected intellectuals and to have two hours to talk about Puerto Rico. The best of all is that I also get to call these guys my friends. So I will leave you to them and they will all present their work and then we will have time for questions and answers. Okay? Welcome everybody. So Ismail, you're up. Good evening. Uh, I just wanna thank the Center for Latin American Studies, uh, Victoria Stone for all her help uh, organizing uh, this event. Um, I will briefly introduce the topic and then let uh, Professor Cordero and uh, Professor uh, Frankie uh, make uh, their presentations. The idea for this event uh, came about from a request that I received uh, from Patrick Nevelin, uh, the editor 
the blog editor of FOCA, uh, the Journal of Global and Historical Anthropology, to write a contribution in response to the de developments in Puerto Rico within the context of the Greek Dead Talks. The mainstream press in the United States has covered uh, Puerto Rico's economic pr problems widely during this summer. But most of the articles comparing Puerto Rico to Greece means or do not explain, explain at all uh, the political status of Puerto Rico. An example of this, of how uh, the press and politicians in Puerto Rico uh, happened in early July to, of this year and I didn't, at an event discussing the great debt crisis in Frankfurt. The German finance minister, Wolf, Wolfgang Schiavo, sarcastically talked about a conversation that he had with the U.S. Secretary Jack Lew, responding to pressure from the U.S. government for a resolution on the pending Greek debt talks. He told Secretary Lew that the European Union could take Puerto Rico into the Eurozone if the U.S was willing to accept Greece into uh, a dollar union. In the video of the event, uh, one, one can appreciate people laughing at Shovel's uh, remarks. Uh, let me, let's see the, the video. It takes a while. Unless you, if you don't, Understand German, you'll see the Die Vereinigten subtitles. Staaten so, können sich gar nicht vorstellen, was in einer Währungsunion was das heißt. Aber ich habe dieser Tage meinem Freund Jack Lou angeboten, dass wir Puerto Rico in die Eurozone übernehmen könnten, wenn die USA Griechenland in die Dollarunion übernehmen würden. <lacht> er fand es ein Scherz. Sie dürfen ruhig klatschen. Die europäischen Verträge schließen bei Staatsschulden einen Schuldenschnitt aus. Das ist ein, Vertrag, ein Verstoß gegen das Bailout-Verbot im europäischen Primärrecht. Und, und Minister Sapin kennen sich übrigens schon seit Studienzeiten. Ich habe dann zu Euklid gesagt, ich mache einen Vorschlag. Wenn ihr wirklich ein bisschen anfangen wollt, Vertrauen zurückzugewinnen, Tut doch einmal, einfach mal die eine oder andere Maßnahme, die ihr machen wollt, wenn wir, was weiß ich, macht sie einfach. Geht morgen in euer Parlament und just do it. Das würde wahnsinnig viel Vertrauen gewinnen. Bei den Griechen, was ebenfalls aus Umfragen hervorgeht, aber das ist keine so große Überraschung. Vielleicht kommen wir her. Okay. Puerto Ricans uh, seem oblivious to Shabbos' comments. They didn't care at all about his comments. The press in Puerto Rico didn't cover that. Uh, but interestingly enough, his comments say more about Germany's intentions and its role in the grip that, than about Puerto Rico. Schiavo showed how leading politicians in powerful nations relate to poorer countries from which they extract wealth. Meaning that, you know, let's swap countries like if there's no any, any, any historical background to this, right? At the times of Shabo's comments, the government of Puerto Rico owed $72 billion in public debt. It is important to consider that the debts were incurred in a political climate where the island's three previous governors have not been reelected to a second term. This is a strong evidence for a long-standing public discontent in the face of acute economic problems plaguing Puerto Rico for over a decade now. The economy has been contracting, labor participation uh, has been decreasing, and unemployment hovers at around 12 to 15 percent. Mass migration to the U.S. mainland and an aging population could worsen the situation in Puerto Rico as the ta tax base further shrinks and an administration desperate for revenue uh, implements another wave of taxes and reduction of public services. Unlike Greece, Puerto Rico is that the jure colony of the United States. 
Chavos implied that having Puerto Rico as a German colony, colony would be less of a headache than having Greece in the European Union. The German Minister of Finance made his comments after the recent announcement of Puerto Rico's governor, Alejandro Garcia Padilla, that his government is not able to pay the island's debt. Garcia Padilla emphasized that for resolving the issue, it is now the turn of Puerto Rico's creditors and called them to negotiate in order to restructure, restructure payments. His announcement was made in the context of the Greek debt talks and referendum, and I don't think this, this happened by chance. In his message to the people of Puerto Rico, Garcia Padilla rejected more tax increases, pensions cuts, and the elimination of the U.S. federal minimum wage in Puerto Rico. But that, this was in July. We'll see tomorrow because the government of Puerto Rico uh, is unveiling a plan of economic adjustment uh, tomorrow. So we'll see if uh, Garcia Padilla changed uh, his mind. Even though Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States and limited by Washington's monetary and fiscal policies, the response of the Obama administration is that it would not rescue the government of the islands. And of course, this crisis, this economic crisis and the debt has affected the working poor. Half of the approximately 5,000 Puerto Rican seasonal farm workers in the United States began migrating in the last 10 years. As even ret ret retirees have started to migrate, the vast majority of people staying in Puerto Rico are those with the steady jobs, but also those who cannot afford to migrate. Until the debt crisis is resolved and socioeconomic st stability is restored, the Puerto Rican exodus will continue to the United States. And finally, return returning to Shovel's proposal that the U.S. and the EU could swap Greece and Puerto Rico, one can argue that for the imperial politician of the 21st century, that problems may look similar throughout the world. But the particularities of the case of Puerto Rico lies in its political status as a colony of the United States. In order to understand Puerto Rico's debt crisis in relation to Greece, we need to look at its history. And tonight we have two leading Puerto Rican scholars to discuss that history. Thank you. Let me figure this out one second. If we seem to overlap, it's because we collaborate and have the same view. So uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I guess uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain a few facts on um, Puerto Rico's uh, debt crisis. And I just returned from Puerto Rico, and uh, I love to take pictures when I go to uh, the island. And one of the things that I can say is that I've never seen, I've never seen so many flags. Flags on the remnants of some dogs, old dogs. Flags on the windows of doctor's offices. I've never seen this. And I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and I try to visit twice a year. I've never seen so many flags. What does this mean? I don't know, but um, it's curious, and this uh, picture in particular, I don't know, um, I'm not going to say anything about it, but you could write, you could write a whole book on this. Look at the flag in the middle of the ocean. Is, is that hope? Is that um, um, pride in the face of adversity? And this was all over the place, all over the place. So, um, this past June 28, the governor of Puerto Rico, Alejandro Garcia Padilla, chucked creditors when he announced that the island public debt of $72 billion then, now 73, was unpayable. That, of course, brought the issue 
to the front and center in American media. Uh, then on August the 3rd, uh, Puerto Rico, in fact, defaulted on the debt by paying only a fraction of what was due. The government of the island paid only $628,000 um, of a $58 million payment due on its public finance corporation bonds. I was in Puerto Rico at the time, and as I heard the news on AM, AM radio, I felt compelled to find cover lest a piece of falling sky hit me on the head, since that's what media is uh, telling you, something horrible is going to happen when Puerto Rico defaults. So I heard the news at a local beach bar, a Chinchorro, and the bar owner and the local clientele, they seemed entranced as they listened to the AM radio, and of course, we engaged in conversation, and it soon became apparent that they really did not have a firm grasp of what the debt crisis was or how it affected their business or daily lives. Yet, they knew the economy was bad and that the debt crisis was somehow linked to it. So what is the debt crisis? We have public debt in Puerto Rico is roughly $73 billion. The economy has been contracting, contracting for over a decade. Unemployment hovers around 12, 13%, but this is nothing new in Puerto Rico, right? But look at this. In July 2015, there were 990, 992,000 people employed in Puerto Rico. Compare that to when most people uh, tried to find the root of this economic crisis, 1993, 975,000 people were employed over 20 years ago. Actually, 20 years ago, sorry. So, Puerto Rico per capita income is one third that of the United States. But then again, it's been like that for a while now. Uh, it's also about half of that, half of that the poorest state, Mississippi. Puerto Rico poverty rates 45% in comparison with 15% in the United States as a whole. 37% of the population receives nutritional assistance compared to 13% of the population in the 50 states. Puerto Rico's population has shrunk by more than 5% in, uh, in the last 10 years. And I remember growing up in Puerto Rico, uh, I don't know, we have this, um, Puerto Rico, we have this tendency to say, yeah, we're going to reach 4 million. And I remember we were always waiting to reach 4 million. We're 3.7, 3.9, all of a sudden, whoa, what happened? I guess we like numbers and growing, growing any possible way. And now the population is shrinking due to... Uh, the economic crisis that is entering the second decade, which has led to a massive exodus. But look at this number for a while, because um, as you probably heard, economic, economic analysts and experts and talking heads and even people in Puerto Rico, they say that Puerto Ricans need to feel the hunger so they move to, so, so they would have said, so they would go out and look for jobs. And these numbers speak to the contrary. I mean, it's not like Puerto Ricans are not hungry enough. And I'm going to show you later a couple of videos uh, of some lazy Puerto Rican having a great day at the beach, fishing. So, <clears throat> so okay, so that's, that's the crisis, a debt and economic crisis. So the barkeeper and his patrons, like most people I talked to in Puerto Rico this past August, engaged in the old game of blaming the blues or the red, the PNPs or the populares, depending on what political party you support. So they blamed these two parties for the current crisis, and they could not think of any ideas to fix the problem other than voting the current incumbent out of office. As <clears throat> Ismail mentioned, uh, this is a phenomenon that I call one-termism. Um, the last three incumbents, the last uh, three previous uh, incumbents have not been reelected to a second term. And the current administration will surely join the not-so-happy club. Actually, I don't want to guarantee anything, but I don't see, I don't see how, um, I mean, the current governor is being challenged by his own party. So 
One termism reflects a long-standing public, dis uh, reflects long-standing public discontent in the face of acute economic problems plaguing Puerto Rico for more than a decade now. It also reflects the futility of Puerto Rican politics as voters replace administration after administration without bothering to, to check if their economic policies differ in any meaningful way. They just want change. More often than not, the overall policies of the Popular Democratic Party, the PPD, which stands for, Commonwealth, for, for the Commonwealth formula, formula or maintaining the status quo, and those of the new Progressive Party, the PMP, which seeks federated statehood, are one and the same. We're gonna see in slide uh, four, if we look at this table, we will notice that both parties have contributed equally to the debt crisis, starting with the administration of Dr. Pedro Rosselló, which increased um, the public debt by 13 billions, uh, basically doubling, doubling um, the public debt left by the administration of Rafael Hernandez Colón. But if you look at this, both parties have contributed equally to increasing the debt. And from 1993 to 2013, uh, um, the public debt increased by $61 billion in 20 years. But let's go beyond the blame game and let us assume that these administrations were led by capable people interested in moving the country forward and fixing the island's economic problem. So what stopped them? So what stopped stop them from, at the very least, not making the situation worse? Let's go to the 1990s. And we're going to see, as Mary had point out, uh, pointed out, the current economic crisis uh, in Puerto Rico originated in the 1980s, 1990s, maybe a decade earlier, for, um, for the root of the problem is the island's economic model. So Puerto Rico's economy uh, faltered in the late 1970s and 80s, but maintained investment through Section 936 of the U.S. Internal Revenue Code, designed in 1976 specifically to attract mainland investors to Puerto Rico. The 936 section picked up the slack. The island, the island grew ever more dependent on Section 936, and uh, uh, you can see, as uh, you can. Uh, Blah, 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 sorry. As you can see, um, at a certain point, uh, they, they were creating about 11% of the jobs in the island. So what happened? Um, the system began, began to be dismantled in the 1990s as part of a compromise between the Clinton administration and the Republican Party. The gradual elimination um, of this tax exception is in great part responsible for this acceleration of Puerto Rico's economy. And what happened is that once the Cold War was over, the, uh, Congress had no incentives for continuing this program. The 936 were created at a moment, at a critical moment during the Cold War in which Puerto Rico had to look like the pearl of the Caribbean in opposition to Cuba. Cuba was to be a failure, Puerto Rico was to be a success. Once the Berlin Wall came down, there was no reason to keep the 936. So, too many facts. Go, don't get dizzy. Um, so, Puerto Rico's response was to uh, increase borrowing for public wars, including a universal healthcare system, and that seemed to work at first because Puerto Rico still enjoy relative economic prosperity and a solid tax base. But by the year 2000, the effect of gradual elimination of section 936 was quite palpable. You had um, hundreds of factories left, unemployment rose, and the tax base diminished. And administration after administration, they just kept on battling. So what can Puerto Rico do now? I mean, they kept on borrowing and they kept passing the buck forward until they couldn't do it anymore, which is what we have now. 73 billion in public debt. So 
As we know, Puerto Rico cannot enact its own monetary policies, which is something that independent countries do to try to solve their financial problems, right? We cannot do that. And Puerto Rico cannot restructure its debt under the protection of Chapter 9 of the U.S. Bank, uh, bankruptcy Code, and no one actually can tell you why. I look all over. Some people say, yeah, I used to exploit the colony. I'm like, yeah, find me a document or tell me how, how is that possible. And apparently, in the 1970s, in the 1970s, Congress tried to fix this and include Puerto Rico, and they couldn't figure it out. So they just say, forget about it. So, but we're looking for exceptions. And just so you know that there is a crisis, we have um, bipartisan cooperation in Puerto Rico, and the Office of Puerto Rico Representative to Congress, Pedro Luisi, introduced on February 11, uh, Beach Bill HR 870, seeking to, um, um, to, extend, uh, to extend the protection of Chapter 9 to Puerto Rico, so, we, so the island can restructure its debt. So, this is a very touchy political issue, as anything in Puerto Rico is. Um, if it finally happens, uh, the PPD will claim that this is in fact more autonomy, that the island is, is moving to uh, what is called, um, well, it's more autonomy for the Commonwealth. It's a way of showing that the ELA continues to be viable and that eventually Puerto Rico could get more and more autonomy under this model, that there's no reason to change it. Of course, if I was one of the ideologues of the PMP, I would say that this just moved the island closer to statehood. So, you can see, you know, everyone has an opinion. There's many ways of manipulating, um, manipulating facts and data for your political purposes. So, I think everyone wins. Um, to be a, a political guru, I, I would say that uh, the ones that are going to be able to really, if this finally happened, the PMP, actually Pierre Luisi is going to be the one who can claim, yeah, I got this for the island. It wasn't the governor. So there's one problem with this. Only about a third of Puerto Rico's debt can be restructured under Chapter 9, and that is the debt owned by municipalities. So, some people have argued that Puerto Rico needs um, a special Chapter 9 in which all the debt is restructured. I, right now, these two bills are stalled in Congress, but since there seems to be a lot of uh, momentum uh, in the U.S. Uh, behind supporting doing something for Puerto Rico, it, we may see um, a change in Congress. Puerto Rico is going to get... Um, and a special chapter nine, and that only a third of the debt will be restructured. So, another alternative is reforming the Jones Act, especially the cabotage laws, and Article, especially Article 27 of the U.S. Merchant Marine Act of 1920, in which some people claim increases uh, the cost of imports and export in Puerto Rico for about 20%, and deprives Puerto Rico of jobs. Actually, some um, studies, studies show that eliminating the Jones Act um, could create up to 50,000 jobs. Also, a federal bailout has been touted, or some people have said that it's 73 billion. Congress could just bail out the island, right? So, as uh, Ismail mentioned, the Obama administration has not been uh, really interested in solving um, this matter, or um, in many ways, he has treated Puerto Rico as if, as if Puerto Rico were an independent country with its own fiscal and monetary policies, and it is not. It is not. So, federal bailout has been touted as unacceptable to U.S. taxpayers. A while ago, I wrote a, an opinion piece on this because um, kind of irks me a little bit, that reasoning 
unacceptable to U.S. tax payers. And that is because for, one per, for, for you to accept this kind of logic, you have to believe two things that are wrong. One, that Puerto Ricans are not U.S. citizens. And second, that Puerto Ricans pay no taxes. So, <clears throat> Puerto Ricans do pay taxes, and they're citizens too. The taxes that they pay uh, in the territory, and I'm talking about the territory, right? Puerto Ricans who live in, uh, in Puerto Rico, import and export taxes, federal community taxes, social security and Medicare taxes, and for, the, the, for those last two taxes, Puerto Ricans don't, um, Puerto Rico is not returned fully. Those taxes are paid in full and the benefits are not returned in full. So, but Puerto Rico also contributes to the United States greatly in many other ways. And though I'm not going to talk about a brain drain, which uh, studies uh, from the Center, uh, Center for Puerto Rican Studies have shown that we cannot call it that. But Puerto Rico do expert doctors, engineers, lawyers, paramedics, professors, um, policemen, and soldiers, servicemen and women. So, Puerto Rico do contribute in many ways to the United States. So, um, my colleague um, Hector is going to talk more about this, but um, as I previously mentioned, uh, economists have come with this idea that Puerto Rico needs to uh, reduce the federal minimum wage, uh, cut on public services, and uh, pensions. And seriously, what is the, um, sometimes I look at these models, and it's like someone created this model in the comfort of an office with a con air conditioning, and they never bothered to check Puerto Rico's condition. Because for me, it sounds like and this is, some, this is something that uh, someone, uh, a talking head in Fox News says, uh, said, um, let's return Puerto Rico to a more Caribbean reality. What do you mean by a more Caribbean reality? So, do Puerto Rican have to stop driving cars? Maybe go back to ox carts? Uh, decide, we don't need shoes. We were too... Uh, we're wearing too, uh, too much clothing, right? We have a beach, we only need shorts. We can always get bananas from the interior and fish a little bit, right? What do they mean by a more Caribbean reality? So, you've seen this on Bloomberg News, for, uh, Forbes, Wall, Wall Street, and like, they, like I mentioned, the, uh, I mean, one of the main evils or the root of Puerto Rico's uh, trouble is the federal minimum wage. Because supposedly, um, the federal minimum wage, um, sorry, supposedly uh, the federal minimum wage drive prices high, inflation, um, disincentivizes uh, people from hiring. I was talking to a colleague and he says that not that many people uh, use the federal minimum wage to, uh, I mean, work for minimum. Uh, federal minimum wage to begin with, and that, as you know, uh, certain businesses are exempted from paying federal minimum wage, just like in the U.S. So, you know, sometimes I, I have to wonder, where, where do they come up with these ideas? But, <clears throat> just imagine this. If some people in Puerto Rico work for federal minimum wages, and they still, they don't make enough, and they have to rely on public assistance, even when making public minimum wages, how is cutting the federal minimum wage cut the dependency on welfare? It would make it worse. But that's just me here using logic. So let me show you this video of lazy Puerto Ricans at the beach. This is um, the beach of El Combate. And I am only recording these three uh, uh, fishermen, but there's actually three on each side of the NASA, of the net. Uh, they threw it uh, during the night, right? And there's also four um, divers. 
So as you can see, um, I engage in conversation with them because I guess that once you leave your country, when you return, you have to return as a social cultural anthropologist every time you visit. And they estimated that they actually catch about 400 pounds of fish. 400 pounds. They had been working for over 12 hours, 10 men, and they had at least another six hours to go. They were basically uh, finishing to pull the NASA in. Uh, they're just starting. It took them like another hour to get it out. Um, they got 400 pounds of fish. If they're lucky, they're going to sell uh, that fish for about $3 a pound to uh, a fishery, a pescaderia. More often than not, they sell them for two bucks a pound. Two bucks a pound. And they were working all those hours. Ten men with families. So let's say that they sell them, um, that they sell their whole catch for $3. That would be $1,200 or $120 per man. My son was with me, and he said, wow, we should be, we should be pescadores. We will be rich. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> You have to subtract fuel cost, uh, the fuel cost to transport their boats through land from the northwest to the southwest. Because they were, these people were actually from, from Aguadilla, which is in the, northwest, in the northwest, and they were all the way down in the tip, uh, at the tip of the southwest coast fishing because you had to move around. So you have to subtract uh, fuel cost. Um, to transport their, their, uh, their boats uh, through, land, uh, through land, back and forth. They had to uh, uh, provide maintenance for their own uh, boats, right? And food and drink, it's a whole day's work. It's at least three meals. So when they get those 120 bucks, and you know, they spend a whole day, the whole day fishing, they can probably do this twice with luck, three times a week. So you ask yourself, how do they survive? They have la tarjeta de la familia, uh, which is the equivalent of food stamps, public health care, Section 8, even though they work and they work hard. And that brings against the question how Korean welfare will incentivize people like these fishermen to work. I mean, to work harder. They already, uh, they're already scrapping by even though they work very, very hard. So. So what, can ha uh, so what can Puerto Rico do? And this is, um, there's a mix of things that Puerto Rico can do. First, the debt needs to be restructured. The cabotage law needs to be eliminated. And it's, like I say, the cabotage law are really a very touchy issue. I don't see, I haven't heard, I don't know, I may be mistaken, but I don't know if any, uh, politician of the pro statehood party has supported this measure because it would be another win for the Commonwealth. It would be more autonomy and a more, and again, uh, preferential treatment. So um, then again, if, if the proposal gets momentum, it would be kind of political suicide for uh, support of statehood not to support it. Then again, Puerto Rico will benefit from developing and, the, and diversifying the, agric uh, the agricultural sector guided by a comprehensive public policy. There's lots and lots of unused land in Puerto Rico and um, Puerto Rico do have the means to diversify its agricultural sector. So future administration, they need to promote the development of small and medium local businesses. If you go to Puerto Rico, you're going to see people complaining about there's no business in downtown anymore, blah, 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 while they go and buy everything at Walgreens, Walmart, Sam's, and Costco. And they cannot explain. They, they, they wonder what happened to local businesses. Finally, the government of Puerto Rico needs to ease the tax burden on the popular sectors and the middle class as opposed to previous policies of creating a tax haven for corporations and multimillionaires. 
Puerto Rico had a bad economic model based on tax exemption. And it ran its course in the 70s. And thanks to the Cold War, Puerto Rico was given another lifeline. When the lifeline was, take, uh, was taken, the model crumbled down. And that's the economic crisis. Thank you. Thanks to Teresita and uh, 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 Victoria and to Ismael for putting this event together. Let me try to get out of this and put my show. All right, thanks to uh, Harry also for giving you some background on kind of how we got to where we are today and some potential solutions for the crisis. Puerto Rico has multiple crises overlapping at the same time. It's not just one crisis. There's a, uh, most certainly a, a social dimension to the crisis with declining population and increased out migration. There's a economic dimension to the crisis reflected in reductions in employment and flattening of incomes, and Harry presented some of that data. There's a fiscal dimension to the crisis reflected in high levels of government debt. And there's certainly a political dimension to the crisis as everything having to do with Puerto Rico has to do with politics. Um, what I want to do in the time that I have here is to walk you through a critique of a report issued by the government of Puerto Rico around the same time that the governor made the announcement that the debt couldn't be paid. They had commissioned uh, uh, Anne Kruger, uh, who was a former chief economist at the International Monetary Fund, to write kind of a blueprint justifying why the government was taking the stance that it was taking that the government was, that the debt was unpayable. And in that report, they went through an analysis of Puerto Rico's fiscal situation and also made some uh, recommendations in their eyes of things they thought Puerto Rico should do to uh, uh, change, change its course and maybe come out of the crisis. Um, this, this report essentially became a blueprint for one set of working groups that the government has put together to issue what they call the uh, Plan uh, de Ajuste Fiscal, which is supposed to be released at the end of August, but because of Erica, government claimed it didn't have enough time to finish uh, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, and needed until today when the governor met at 3.30 with the legislature to tell them what was in the report, and then tomorrow apparently is going to be a release to the public. So the underpinnings of this report, and, and I'm particularly concerned about, as the title of my presentation suggests, about the education, minimum wage, welfare, employment, income relationship in Puerto Rico. Uh, that is very central to the arguments in this report. And what I did was essentially took a close reading of the report, hoping that after all the hundreds of thousands of dollars that the Government Development Bank had invested in producing this report, I would be inundated with data supporting the, the propositions advanced in the report. And uh, 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 I was unpleasantly surprised to realize that the data that I was looking for was uh, 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 not there, and perhaps I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. The report's called the Kruger Report, and what I did was, you go, can go over the different sections of the report, and there's an argument about Puerto Rico being a low-skilled place, kind of low education. There's a bunch of low education, low-skilled people. Uh, that employment laws are too generous. Uh, and at some point, there's even a complaint about br uh, breastfeeding breaks that, that women supposedly get and how that's a problem because it's too generous. To, uh, uh, um, and that the minimum wage, of course, is too high and too generous. And you hear the word generous coming up in this report a lot around uh, employment laws around the minimum wage, and especially given that Puerto Rico is this low-skilled place. Uh, 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 um. Then there's more arguments about welfare being too generous, and they throw a number in there that a person, uh, a family of three on welfare can make more money than, uh, than if they were working. And they throw the number and they don't put any citation, any reference, uh, no backup of where that number comes from, simply just throw it out there. And I've asked a lot of people, where that number come from? And they're like, well, but 
They didn't make it up. It must come from somewhere. I found out where it came from, and uh, 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 it's, it's, it's really uh, shaky. But I'll, I'll walk you through kind of my, my recalculations of that, of that number. But welfare is now a disincentive to work. People rather sit at home, collect the check, uh, 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 this generous welfare, and that explains why Puerto Rico's participation is really low. You know, uh, very generous welfare, people rather just stay at home and, 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 and chill. So in the end, uh, she says, that they say in the report, employment laws are very generous, welfare is very generous, welfare is a disincentive to work, employment laws should be reduced and streamlined and eliminated, and welfare payments should be cut to kind of push people uh, 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 back to the labor market. So they summarize their, their, or the summary of their argument is essentially that Puerto Rico is a low-skilled place, welfare is too generous, Employment laws are too generous. The minimum wage is too high and generous, of course. Uh, uh, welfare is a disincentive to work, and therefore labor force participation is low. So labor force participation is low because the uh, uh, welfare is too generous, and the minimum wage is too high, which means that people can't afford to hire workers. Uh, it's essentially the bottom line of, of their argument. And my sense is that this, uh, that as the economic crisis in Puerto Rico uh, uh, um, uh, has gained more public attention, we have like a good news, bad news situation. The good news is that we'll talk more about Puerto Rico. Thanks for being here. It's important that we discuss it. The bad news is that we're talking about Puerto Rico in ways that are wildly distorted and that promote these kinds of stereotypes that, uh, that I've been talking about, which I call this kind of uh, uh, colonial mythology of the undeserving, lazy Puerto Rican, right? We can cut down to kind of the essence. And, 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 and again, I was kind of looking for an attempt to find some data to support this, and, 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 and I basically did not find much. Uh, and what makes this mythology powerful is that it capitalizes on the worst colonial stereotypes, it obscures real problems, and it helps advance really particularistic agendas. Also, a lot of people in Puerto Rico and beyond actually believe these myths and can point to all kinds of stories and anecdotal evidence that confirm these myths about the ayudas that are true. You know how many people, and I want to walk, one of my dreams is to do a documentary where I interview everybody in Puerto Rico that says, well, you know, but you know, gente en Caserillo, they have a television and they have a car. And uh, this kind of mythology. And what happens is that in a class anxiety uh, uh, or in the class anxiety of a consumer society where the incomes have been flat, people punch down, you know, and they look for explanations by, by pointing to the benefits of those that are better off. But when, again, when you scratch beyond that surface, you find that the story is not true. So there are six myths about Puerto Rico that I think we should unpack and deconstruct and destroy. Number one, the Puerto Rico has low levels of education. And I'll walk you through the data. It's not, you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts, right? But it ain't some backwater low education place. And I'll kind of show you some numbers that show that. And all I'm saying here is also part of a larger presentation that has about 90 slides that anybody that wants it, just give me your email address or email me and I can send it to you. And you can see the full deck that I don't have time to present, obviously, today. Puerto Rico has low levels of education. People in Puerto Rico do not want to work. This is the second myth. Third myth, welfare payments are too generous. The fourth myth, welfare is a disincentive to work and able-bodied working age males can get welfare easily, right? Just don't have to work and decide to chill in your couch and the check will come in the mail. It's as easy as that, as, as, as you hear it from the stories. The minimum wage is too high, as Harry and others have, have tried to, to, to address and, and, and deconstruct, have addressed and tried to deconstruct. And low wage workers, the poor and other vulnerable populations are to blame for Puerto Rico's financial and economic crisis. Just spend too much money after bad, lazy people. And that's kind of how we borrow all this money to give services to all these bad, lazy people that want to sit at their home and not work. And that's how Puerto Rico's problems uh, got to where they are. So in the rest of the time I have left, my, my job is to try to destroy each and every one of these myths by kind of pointing to some data that can help us at least try to see whether the strengths are true or not. Myth number one, Puerto Rico has low levels of education. It's a low human capital economy. Again, in the bigger deck, you can see a bunch of slides and read my, my, my comments. If there's anything that's been converging between Puerto Rico and the United States, it's been education. Wages haven't converged, incomes haven't converged, okay? And employment rates haven't converged, but education over the last 40 years between Puerto Rico and the U.S. has converged. And what you have here is the educational distribution for persons 25 years or older in Puerto Rico in 2013, all right? So you have 28.9% of the population that's, say, high school drop, and this is 25 and over. It includes people that are 80, 90, right? So 28.9% of the population less than high school, 26.4% of the population with a high school degree, 
And 44.7% of the population has some college experience, including 32% that have some kind of college degree. 32%, one in three. Does that sound like a low education, backwater, Latin American kind of stereotype place to you? Doesn't to me. Again, it's not Cambridge, Massachusetts, but you have 32% of the population with some kind of college degree. You have 44% of the population with some kind of college experience. So if you compare 65-year-olds in Puerto Rico with 65-year-olds in the U.S., there's a huge education gap. But when you compare 45-year-olds, the gap narrows. When you compare 25-year-olds, Puerto Rico's about average in terms of, 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 of the, especially the lower educated states of the United States. So if Puerto Rico is a low educated backwater place, well, so is Alabama, and so is Mississippi, and so is Louisiana. Puerto Rico is no less educated than any of those places. Point number one, okay? And I won't even spend, I can show you tons of slides on all this stuff, but that one I'll say, well, it's, it, ain't, it ain't Cambridge, but it's not a backwater education. But Puerto Ricans don't want to work. The unemployment rate in Puerto Rico, what you have here on the top, 225,000 persons on the top, 125,000 persons at the bottom, and you see it oscillating with the different business cycles, but there's no year where there's, no, there's less than 125,000 people in Puerto Rico looking for work every goddamn day of the week. 125,000 people. And then, uh, so that's the unemployment rate. People don't want to work, so if people don't want to work, why are there 125,000 people looking for work if they don't want to work? Uh, 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 and then you see the out migration on the top, the bottom line is people returning to Puerto Rico. The top line is people leaving Puerto Rico. And you see that the gap is increasing since 2006, right? People leaving. And they don't leave to go chill at some nice beach in Connecticut. They can be in combate, right? They go to work. And if you look at the labor participation rate of Puerto Rico in the U.S., it's huge compared to that of Puerto Rico because they don't come to chill. They come to work. So this, and, and, and you see the, the population trend of Puerto Ricans in the U.S. at the bottom already exceeding the population in Puerto Rico, which is kind of flattening, right? So if Puerto Ricans don't want to work, why are there 125,000 people or more looking for work every week? And why are there 40, 50,000 leaving every year to the U.S. to look for work? That's 200,000 people actively we have evidence that are looking for work in a place where, quote unquote, people don't want to look for work. And it sound, sounds like a stereotype to me. And, and, and this kind of summarizes the points, but I want you to look at the point before last. I did the calculation last night. So I was listening to Bill Spriggs on WBAI on Labor Day, talking about the working poor in the U.S. And I said, well, let me look at the working poor, which was what, like 10% of full-time workers in the U.S. They work, they work 52 weeks of the year, earn poverty wages. The number of Puerto Rico is 17.8%. There are people that are working 50 to 52 weeks a year, 172,000 people. Working 50 to 52 weeks a year, making below poverty wages. So it's 125,000 people looking for work. There's 50, 60,000 people migrating, and there's 175,000 people working for poverty wages in a place where people don't want to work. And I move to the next one. Uh, uh, welfare payments are too generous. Let's look at the data. What, 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 what do you mean by generosity? What, well, let's look at dollars. I, come, I look, look at generosity by dollars and cents. Show me the money. How much money are we talking about if people are giving to Puerto Rico? Uh, first, that Kruger report uh, gets this data from some other report that was done and I was in, involved in, in, in part of that. And I kind of find the number to show where this number came from. And then I recalculate the numbers because number one, the number says this is how much people get from TANF. But when you actually look at the TANF data, the actual payment is about half of what is in the paper. They looked at some table that says this is the maximum a family can get and plug that number into their model. And I'm saying that's nonsense. You have to plug the number that people actually get. So that reduces the gap, that gap supposed to happen between, between employment. And the second thing is that this report has a household of one person, two persons, three persons, four persons, up to eight people with one worker only. So welfare goes up with the number of kids, but the earnings don't go up because it's just one worker. It's nonsense. A household with eight people doesn't have the same number of workers as a household with one person. In fact, a household of three people, if it's three adults, that's one set of workers. If it's two adults and one child, that's another set of workers. If it's one adult and two children, that's another set of workers, especially if the children are under six. Okay, so they don't make any of these adjustments or any of that. So I went to the TANF data, looked at it. Those are the last two columns, at the, uh, three columns at the, at the, at the bottom, at the, on, on, the, on, the, on the side. It says TANF data, June 2015. There's 63,000 733 people in this TANF program in Puerto Rico out of a poor population of 1.6 million people. You know, um, 66,000 people, <laughs> okay? And of those, 71% are 
are in the, would make more if they work than if they stayed in the program. So they're not in the program because they make more money. They're in the program because they need to be in the program because they don't find work. And the large proportion, as I'll show you a little bit later, are elderly, minors, or disabled. Okay? This is 78,000 people in this program out of 1.6 million. Okay? So there's no way that this subsidy pays more than work because people don't have access to this subsidy. It's a fiction that everybody's getting. Now, PAN is a separate program. That's a nutritional assistance. $300 for a family of three which I don't consider generous on a kind of cash basis. It's, okay, una comprita, but that's, people don't, people don't, don't stop earning $1,500 to get a comprita for $300. They get a comprita for $300 because they don't want their children to starve to death, okay? That kind of seems pretty basic to me. And so I recalculate the numbers, and then I look at, at, at the duration of people in TANF. The people in, in Puerto Rico spend a long time in this welfare program. We hear stories about generations. It's a lifetime. And then about the generosity of the payments. That's the data. I don't want you to look at the data. I just want to see where Puerto Rico is. You don't have to. You can see that from everywhere. That's the pay arranged by the amount of payments from the Alaska, which gives you the most, the biggest welfare payments at about 580 some dollars a month, all the way down to Guam, which is $22. Uh, but Puerto Rico is right between Indiana and Oklahoma at $197 a month. $197 a month is the average program for people in the quote unquote welfare program in Puerto Rico. It's the average monthly payment, $177. $97 a month. So, uh, uh, and then the ne column next to it is the number of months on average that people are on TANF. So I just graph the data, P put one against the other. The, 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 on, uh, along the top, you see the, the amount of money that people get. Along the side, you see the number of months that they spend in the program. And guess where Puerto Rico is? Puerto Rico is in the low quadrant. Low payments, low duration. Every state that is to the right, the people in that state last longer in the TANF program than Puerto Rico. Every state that's to the top of Puerto Rico, the people in that state make more money on welfare than they make in Puerto Rico. So generous in relation to what? To Zimbabwe? Sure. But generous if you compare it to every other state, and Puerto Rico's been a part of the U.S. for over 110 years, so it's reasonable for us to compare ourselves to our master in some way, then they don't look like they last longer on welfare and they don't look like it's any more generous than any of the other states, at least to my eyes. So I summarized kind of those points that I've been verbally uh, uh, discussing. Number four, then this generous welfare that we give people in Puerto Rico, supposed to be some kind of disincentive to work because people rather sit at home and cash in. Um, then first of all, the labor force participation rate in Puerto Rico, and you can compute it in different ways. They use the 40%. That's 40% of people over 16 are in the labor force. But is the people over 16 the right denominator for that equation? So if you do that, you get 46.3% using the census data. The next panel, I say, well, but uh, uh, let's say we have ages 25 to 64. I'm losing my more reasonable working population. Do I want my 16 and 17 year olds to be working full time? Do I want my 85 year olds to be working full time? No, so let me chop the population. That gives you a participation rate of 61%. But that has some people that are disabled, about 9 to 10% of them. Do we expect disabled folks, blind? You know, they, they may work, but do we expect them and we're gonna count them? Well, let's take them off the denominator. Well, that goes to about 69%. So you go from a 40% participation rate to a 69% participation rate if you make some adjustments for age and adjustments for disability. So it doesn't look as low as they like it to, 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 to look when you actually make some reasonable adjustments. And then this is the data on the 16, 5,000 744 people that are in that TANF program. I did just did three, a three-way cut. I looked at gender, male, female, age, young, less than 18, adult, between 18 and 65, and elderly, over 65. And then I did disabled and not disabled. 1.2% of the 65,000 TANF cases, 790 people, are males that are adults and that are not disabled. And you know why they're in the program? Because they're taking care of children that have serious disabilities and they can't work. Not because they can't work, but because their children need care. And, and that's why they also qualify for the program, because they're very poor. So poor, poor fathers, typically, <laughs> because the mother's absent for some other reason. So think you're a poor person, you get into a car accident, the wife dies, the kid ends up disabled. Yeah, you may end up in the TANF program, okay? And I'm not going to complain about that. And the 790 people. You don't see any, point is, you don't see any able-bodied male adults in this program. If you're an able-bodied male adult in Puerto Rico, there's no office you can go to for cash. 
There's no such thing. It's a myth that you can do that. Now, there's 14.2% that are able-bodied women uh, uh, that are not disabled, but they tend to, again, have minor children, and some of the children have, have disabilities. Uh, um, so, did welfare cause a declining employment, or was the declining employment the cost of people going on welfare? Kind of the age-old chicken and egg question. Uh, so I look at the data again. The red line is the employment that Harry showed you. The declining employment since 2006, right? The blue line is the proportion of TANF cases, people on welfare. When you do the chronology, you look at the red arrow, that's where the employment begins to decline. And you look next to it, there's uh, TANF continues to decline as employment declines, but then employment is, you know, starts really hitting people and then they start going on the TANF program. So when you arrange the causality, employment declines happen first, and then by about a year, TANF starts to increase. So the chicken and egg, the, 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 the egg is the employment, and, and, and the chicken is the TANF program. Employment that collapses first, and then people take up the program, as you can clearly see from the chronology of this graph. And then I did the PAN program, and you see the same thing. The red line is employment. The collapse in employment, and what happens after employment collapses is the blue line and increase in PAN. People lose jobs, then they apply for nutritional assistance of $300 a month for a family of three. It's not that the pan is all the way high up here and, and, and then somehow something happens to the employment. I think the causality on both, on both of these in terms of what happens first and what happens second is, is fairly clear. So, is welfare a disincentive to work? And able-bodied working age males can get welfare easily. Puerto Rico has relatively low TANF participation rates. Puerto Rico has relatively low TANF benefit levels. There are no males without disability in the TANF program was 790 uh, out of the 60 some thousand. TANF caseloads case loads follow the pattern of changes in employment, as do the PAN caseloads. And welfare participation does not appear to explain male labor supply, and it may have limited role in explaining the labor supply of females, because again, there are uh, young women, poor, with two minor children, typically being abandoned by their husband, that are in this program. And again, that's a social policy question. There are about 10% of the public population in the program for whom the, the benefits pay more than the work. And again, if, if, if you, 10%, if you ask me as a social policy person, should society have a program so that, so that young women that are poor, that have two minor children that have been abandoned by their uh, partners, uh, get on their feet and feed their children while they'll then get to the, the labor market full time? I will say, yeah, that makes sense to me. I don't want to kick them to the labor market immediately thereafter. You know, there should be a, that's what the program's there for. So if a program exists, I'm not going to complain people using it. Uh, 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 um, I mean, I don't know how much time I have. I'll take another five minutes, sorry. The minimum wage is too high. Listen, if it's good for the goose, why is it good for the gander? So if the minimum wage has been in Puerto Rico in operation from the time the employment was going up and from the time the employment was going down. So if minimum wage is good to, employ the, to explain the collapse in employment, why isn't it good to explain the increase in employment? Get, catch my drift? That's the kind of hypocrisy of the minimum wage argument, that somehow it begins in 2006 to have an effect. Well, if you give credit to the minimum wage for increasing employment for 25 years in Puerto Rico, and then I'll take the hit of having it reduced employment for 10 years in Puerto Rico. But the, but, the, but the only thing that happened in 2006 that we can track that has this effect on the employment was the loss of uh, financial incentive subsidies and, 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 and those firms leaving. The minimum wage doesn't explain this uh, uh, labor market. And then let's look at uh, uh, data on wage levels and, and, and compare. Again, another one where I don't want you to, 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 to even see the numbers. I just want you to see where Puerto Rico is. That's the uh, average and median hourly wage for every single state and the uh, three territories, D.C., Guam, and the Virgin Islands. And that's where Puerto Rico is. Where, where does it look like to you where that it is? The column, the, the, the row below Puerto Rico says total. It's at the bottom, and by far, Puerto Rico is uh, 942. The other two on top of Puerto Rico, who, who are they? Guam and the Virgin Islands, folks. I want Puerto Rico to catch up to Guam and the Virgin Islands. Forget the 50 states and D.C., who's the top state. Okay, the average hourly wage, uh, median hourly wage in the Virgin Islands is $12.36. The median hourly wage in Guam is $12.37. And the bottom, the median hourly wage in Puerto Rico is $9.42, which is about 56% of the U.S. average of $16.81. So the question I ask for those that say the minimum wage is too high is how low should it go? How much lower do you want it to be? 
In other words, how much lower do wages in Puerto Rico have to be before wages in Puerto Rico start catching up to the rest of the states? What's the, what's the economic model and logic of that? You know, if, if, if I if you find the economists that can explain to me, and I've been looking and I asked on Twitter and all of that, and I don't get anyone that can explain to me how lowering wages increases wages. But again, I may be too, too, too complicated or too dense for, for, for those things. And then I did, okay, so let me plot the, the, the state's employment to population ratio by the state's hourly wage. And guess what you find? Puerto Rico's at the very bottom, right? Temp, you know, nine something and 20 uh, some percent employment to population ratio. That's just the employed persons divided by the entire population of the place, okay? It's not the best denominator, but it's one that's constant for all the states. The relationship is that, guess what? The higher the wages, the higher the employment. That's what, that's what I, I, did. I drew the arrow kind of where you would draw a regression line through those points. And it's what, what folks in the business call a positive relationship. Okay? Not a negative relationship. The, the, the place with the highest employment is the place with the highest wages up there. You see it, D.C. There's more people in D.C. There's more employed people in D.C. than the residents of D.C. Because they commute from Virginia and Maryland. And they also make the highest freaking wages in the country. Uh, at about 28 some on average, okay? Uh, um, so when you plot the relationship between wages and employment, you find that more wages go with more employment, not kind of the, 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 uh, the other way around. So I don't find a lot of evidence for, for the minimum wage being the real problem in Puerto Rico for a lot of reasons. And again, that's an, an area where I do a lot more slides. Uh, and then there's a, a, a colleague, Arin Dubé from the University of Massachusetts, who wrote a really thoughtful essay. He's the nation's leading expert on minimum wage research, uh, basically saying when you look at the evidence, the case is very weak, that the minimum wage is really the problem in Puerto Rico. The problem in Puerto Rico is lack of good jobs, you know? Uh, um, it's an employment problem. So what does Kruger see? Let me close here. Kruger recipe for Puerto Rico. She sees a low-skilled place with employment laws that are too generous, with a minimum wage that is too high, with welfare that is too generous, where welfare is a disincentive to work, and with low labor force participation because people don't want to work. They'd rather sit and chill. So the solution from the report is cut welfare, cut wages, cut benefits, and eliminate labor laws. And that's what all the working groups from the from the government are supposed to be doing and supposed to be releasing tomorrow, though, as Harry mentioned, they're afraid to say this. They need to say it for the bondholders, so that the bondholders think they're doing the hard work and, and putting pressure on their own people, but politically, it's a suicidal move. <laughs> uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how they're going to do that dance over the next couple of days. Uh, uh, but again, the, the, so the path that Kruger wants to draw, if we will go back to that path, is she wants more employment, they want more employment, but they don't care about wages. That's the red line. You can increase Puerto Rico's labor force participation at a cheaper wage. That's the path that they're pointing to. And you know, slavery was a full employment economy, right? There was no unemployment under slavery. But we object to that kind of full employment economy, right? We don't think that's fair. And you know, similarly, I would say to our US masters that, you know, paying the cheapest wages to Puerto Ricans ain't no way to treat your colony, you know? Treat us with some respect and, and, and pay us what we're worth. Don't tell us that we're worth less than any other citizen. And that's kind of where we, uh, where we are today. So I think Puerto Rico should go the tried and true path uh, 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 that every other state has followed. Higher wages lead to more employment. So the problem in Puerto Rico is not that the wages are too high, it's that they're too low. And people rather just... Uh, so the consequences that I see if we follow the Kruger recipe, and I promise I'm wrapping up. Reduce power of workers and more inequality. Lower labor uh, protections and more abuse at work. If you reduce the, 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 if you change the probationary period and you can fire people for no cost in a, in a labor market where there's such an abundant labor supply, employers can get away with murder. And you can work hard and you fire the next day because there's 20 people that can take your job. And now that I have even lower minimum wage, it's a buyer's market. I can do with you whatever I want. Is that really what we want? Is that progress for Puerto Rico? Uh, more desperate workers and more labor market circulation. People, rather than staying in one job for a long period of time, they're going to be fired and hired and fired and hired. There's going to be all this kind of circulation for people to try to make ends meet. Higher poverty rates and needier populations is what I see. Lower standards of living and quality of life and an increased wage gap and continued migration, which is kind of where we come in the picture. A couple of days ago, I just figured, you know, let me get the data for Puerto Ricans in the U.S. and compare them to Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico because we're talking about who should we be compared to to Latin America, to the U.S., to, well, let's compare Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico to Puerto Ricans in the U.S. 
What you see there is the age earnings profile. The red line is Puerto Rico, the blue line is the United States. So say you're a 16 year old, starting at the bottom, right? You can, and, and, and everything else is equal, and you can take two roads to your future. One is the I stay in Puerto Rico road, that's the red path, or I go to the US road, and that's what Puerto Ricans in the US are making, that's the blue path. So essentially, a 24 year old in the US makes as much as a 40, Two-year-old in the U.S., in Puerto Rico. Let me say that again. A 24-year-old in the U.S., Puerto Rican, makes as much as a 40-year-old in Puerto Rico. And, 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 and that amount that the 40-year-old makes in Puerto Rico, it's the peak. They ain't going to make any average higher than $20,000. Look at the rest of the Afro. That I call this graph my hair when I was young graph. Okay? Uh, um, so what the people in Puerto Rico want to do is to push that red line even lower because the wages are too high, right? It's too generous. So the gap is going to increase. Guess what? Any person with some sense is going to say, what the hell am I going to stay here for? When I can go to the U.S. and in 10 years, I can make what I can make here in a lifetime. I leave at 20, come back at 35, which is what everybody says, and they never come back, but that's another story. Uh, 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 um, that's by education. So the red, this is how much folk in, uh, by education make in the U.S. the blue line, and in Puerto Rico, the red line. Again, what they want to do in Puerto Rico is to push it down. Let me just close with this one. That's the, earn, the, the kind of percentile earnings. So the blue line, the 99 percentile of earners in Puerto Ricans in the U.S. make about $145,000 on average. The top, the top earners, Puerto Ricans in the U.S. Top earners, Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, make about $100,000. Right? And the two arrows I drew, uh, uh, a Puerto Rican in, in the U.S. that's on the 56th percentile makes as much as a Puerto Rican that's on the 80th percentile. Those are the red and the blue and the blue lines, right? And again, what they want to do is to push this Puerto Rico line further down. Now, Puerto Rico does have a steep increase on the back end, right? That's the, 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 there's a lot of, uh, in a, you know, <laughs> what, that, what that means is that there's an inequality pushing uh, people in the, at, at the higher end. So the last uh, myth that I kind of forgot is this low-wage workers and the poor and other vulnerable populations are to blame for the financial and economic crisis. And I don't have a lot of graphs and data for that. No, they're not. It's kind of my answer. Uh, but, but in the end, this is about more than numbers. This is a debate about fairness and about rights. Do we believe that there's poverty in Puerto Rico? Because there are people that believe that there's no poverty in Puerto Rico. It's just people chilling in their couches getting welfare. They're not really poor. They don't, they're not the kind of deserving poor that we remember. Really? Uh, 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 so first, do we believe there's poverty in Puerto Rico? Or do we believe that Puerto Ricans are the richest poor people in the world? Or the richest poor people in Latin America? That's nonsense. There's real poverty and hunger in Puerto Rico. Just take a walk to places where you, know, you normally don't walk, and you'll see it. Now, the place looks pretty because there's a lot of mirrors, and $72 billion later, lend $72 billion to any Latin American country, and you see buildings pop up all over the place, and the place looks pretty. But we're screwed for that because it's a mirage. <laughs> we don't own that stuff. We, 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 don't, we don't own it. We owe it. <laughs> and, 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 there's a big, and there's a big, big difference. Uh, uh, um, so are citizens entitled to a minimum standard of living? to opportunities for a better future? If people are entitled to food assistance, then why complain that they get food assistance? If they're entitled to housing, why complain they get housing? If they're entitled to healthcare, why complain they get healthcare? Those things should not be part of the comparison. Oh, it's too generous because Puerto Rico can get food, can get welfare, can get housing. Why are they complaining about? Hell, you know? Uh, um, so how should social resources be allocated to provide for that standard? The last slide I'll put uh, uh, is this one, uh, uh, which is, you know, the money being made in Puerto Rico. The thing is, who's making the money in Puerto Rico? And I divided the population into five groups of 20%. It's called in the bottom 20%, the next 20%, the next 20%, the next 20%, and the top 20%. And then I took the cake. And I said, okay, what, how, much, how much of a dollar, that's 100%, would go to each of those percentages in terms of the money that's being made in Puerto Rico? Well, guess what? The bottom 20% of people in Puerto Rico will get a penny, one cent of that dollar. Out of every dollar that's made in Puerto Rico, the bottom 20%, that's about 760,000 people, get a, a penny. The next 20% get 8%. So the bottom 40% in Puerto Rico make 9% of the money. That's about 1.4 million people, 1.5 million people, make 9% of all the money. Third and the fourth, let's go to the top 20%. They make 55% of the dollar, right? So the top 20%, those 797 privileged families that come here with a suntan telling us to work harder to sustain them back in Puerto Rico, right? They're fine. 
They're making 55% of every dollar in Puerto Rico, that top 20%. I compared it to the U.S. households and the U.S. families. And the, the bottom row there is the top 5% of people in Puerto Rico. They make 25% of all the money. So 95% of the people eat 75%, and 5% of the people, the top five, eat 25%. And the top 20% eat 55%, more than half of the pie for the top 20%. There's still 80% of the people we have to feed with what's left. And if you just take the top 40%, forget it. You have 14 plus 8 plus 1 to feed 60% of the population. You see where I'm going, right? Power in Puerto Rico is inequality, and it's who's making the money. And we don't hear anything about that in any of these reports. Why? Because the elite in Puerto Rico doesn't want you to hear about any of this stuff. They don't want to tax themselves. They'd rather, they'd rather tax you here in the U.S. so you can pay and support the, the, the population over there. And they'd rather come you, to you here with a sing and dong, uh, sing and uh, crying and, and barrilito tres estrellas. So they can say, yeah, uh, we want you to lobby and, 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 and solve our problems here in Puerto Rico, whereas we don't want to tax ourselves and we're not going to make the hard decisions to pay what we need to pay to support our population and stop stealing the money, which is kind of what they've been doing. So... Um, let me finish there with a kind of caption contest. And I'll let you figure out where the story ends. Okay? Uh, 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 is the Puerto Rican diaspora going to continue to play this game of doing whatever the elites in Puerto Rico want us to do so that they can maintain their nice standard of living while the rest of us work here at rear ends? Or are we going to start demanding some, some rights as a diaspora and say, okay, we'll help you. How about giving us a couple of senators in that Puerto Rican legislature you have there? How about giving us some, some representatives at large so that we can, we don't, we're not town mayors, we're not giving out cement or, or bricks to people, we're there for transparency and accountability. But we don't do that, right? And we let the Puerto Rican elites tell us, oh, you left. So you have none to say here. Well, we support our families, we support it. Who supports the airline industry, the rental car industry, the hotel industry, the restaurant industry in Puerto Rico? But if, but, but if not us. So, so, so if we don't have our, 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 our right to go tell our brothers and sisters there to put their crap in order, uh, 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 then I don't know who does. And I think it behooves us to have that kind of attitude uh, because not having it has cost us dearly and uh, it's going to cost our family, friends, and relatives in Puerto Rico a lot more. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Ismael and Harry and Hector for um, all of that amazing information. Um, questions? Comments? Yes, Marcos. Um, I was very disappointed when there was a hearing in Congress a few months ago and Ruben Berrios from the Independence Party basically told Congress people, you don't want to give statehood to Puerto Rico because you don't want a welfare state. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't we're, we're, uh, Puerto Rico's going to be a ghetto state is what he said. A ghetto state. I was disappointed because I don't think independentistas should be using fear, just like I don't think the Republicans should be using fear to sell their, their, their propaganda, right? If you want to sell your position, sell it on its merits. Now, what, about, what, what if the U.S. comes tomorrow and tells Puerto Rico the following? We'll pay you $72 billion if you get the hell out of here. We'll give you the independence. We'll pay the bill. You go on your merry way tomorrow. Will Puerto Rico take that deal? Is it a good deal? Uh, 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 I think that there are they're, 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 they're really important questions we need to ask ourselves about the whole issue of status options. And, and I could see a really good statehood and I could see a really bad statehood. I could see a really good independence and I could see a really bad independence. I'm not going to talk about the Commonwealth because that's what we got and we know it's broke. Uh, 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 but the other two options, I'm less uh, dogmatic and ideological about what it sounds like and I'm more interested in seeing the deal. I want to see the, the, the writing. What kind of statehood are you going to offer, offer me? If you offer me a nice statehood that the kind I like, I don't got a problem. I live here in New York City. I'm cool. I can, I'm, nobody makes me less Puerto Rican. Uh, you can give me a really crappy independence that you put the IMF and the CIA to run my country the next day, and what do I gain from that? 
do I, do, I, do I really guarantee that my people are gonna have a better future if, if I got the, the, the that, if that's the scenario? I don't know, so sorry, I'm not giving you like a clear vamos pa encima con la independencia kind of answer, <laughs> or a kind of rabid statehood answer, because I think in the end we need to be smart about this negotiation, because it is a negotiation between two peoples in the end. Mm -hmm. And we don't, know, we don't treat it as such. Harry, did you want to address that as well? Yeah, uh, regarding independence, I think that one of the problems with the independence movement is that they uh, haven't developed an, alterna an economic alternative. If you talk to supporter of independence, they say once we're independent, we're going to be able to bring more uh, foreign investment. Um, what are you going to offer them? Tax breaks. I'm like, come on, that's exactly what got us into this mess with the difference that at least uh, under the current colonial system, when things go bad, there's someone to complain to. So uh, I often wonder how is Puerto Rico changed the trade balance, let's say, with uh, resurgent Argentina or Brazil. And the main idea, and I, and I talk to everybody when I go to Puerto Rico, and the main idea among supporters of independence is like, well, basically, once we become independent, we're going to be welcoming to the Latin American family of nations, and they're going to give us stuff for free. That's the bottom line. I mean, they think that Brazil is going to give us cars, that Argentina is going to give us cows, just because we just rejoined our family. And they have an even worse economic program than the current Commonwealth and the statehooders, which for me is, I mean, there could be a working independent, but right now no one is suffering uh, a system that may work. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. How many times has the economic model of Puerto Rico been revised? The economic model as a model, how many times it's been revised? There is a list that includes about 45 different reports that have been issued over time, uh, starting from with Togwell <laughs> all the way down to the Kruger report now and goes through Tobin and other Nobel Prize winning economists that have looked at it. I think Puerto Rico is second only to Africa in the number of reports that have been written with, with plans for its development and in the uselessness of those reports because a lot of them conclude with the following kind of sentences that says, and doing all of this and all of that depends on whether Congress and the U.S. and Puerto Rico can renegotiate and find more stability in the terms because investors don't want to put in 20, 30-year money. They don't know what the political future is going to look like. So, so it kind of reverts back. And, and also some of the reports kind of uh, I'll propose some bitter medicine mm -hmm. that the electorate in Puerto Rico is unlikely to go for, and politicians, you know, they want to sell people what they think they, they want to buy, so they don't. And I'm not trying to talk about this, this tough medicine. I talk about, for example, taxing the rich in Puerto Rico. <laughs> and I talk about cutting welfare for the poor. To me, that's, you, know, you, don't, you don't get a lot, of money, a lot of money from that. What you get a lot of money is in the untaxed wealth that has been accumulated in Puerto Rico by the local elites over the last 20, 25 years in both housing real estate assets and in financial assets mm -hmm. that are not invested back in Puerto Rico but are invested right here downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, 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 and that's a challenge and I think, they're, they're, but, 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 they're, but the elite runs the place. So they're not gonna increase their taxes. They wanna put it on Uncle Sam and wanna put it on the US taxpayer as much as they can because, you know, they, 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 they claim poverty. And we have this hypocrisy that for the rich in Puerto Rico we give them incentives and for the poor in Puerto Rico, we give them fuerte. Mm -hmm. Yes. With uh, uh, the U.S. has been part of Puerto Rico for over 110 years, and uh, a lot of what has happened to it and how its economy has ended up has been because of decisions that have been made by politicians and and financial interest in the U.S. without Puerto Rican participation, and to me, that has a price. That's like, a, if you're injured in court, 
And then you sue somebody and you say, you injured me, you caused me harm, therefore you need to pay up. So an independence where the deal is, we pay you $72 and you start from scratch tomorrow and we don't want to give you any wealth or anything like that, it's a bad deal. An independence where you have a $72 billion, they pay the debt, and in addition they give me a $72 billion, well let's say 100 to make a round number. 10 year, <laughs> 10 -year development fund like the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. I'll take that independence. Mm -hmm. And they can do it if Puerto Rico were a state. Because the other states would go like, wait, where's my $100 million billion fund? But they could do it with, a, with, a, with an independence transition. It's negotiated between two peoples. Mm -hmm. Anything is possible when you're negotiating between two peoples. It's just that we're kind of timid, you know, and, and we, we, you know, we approach Americano you know, with that. You know, exactly. It's a huge part of the problem. We don't claim our rights. I see you. I mean, Congress people, yeah. 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 But that's not going to happen. The current status of the LLPs, it's, it's neither. And where has it gotten? 73 billion in debt. And the same people who have uh, put us in that debt are blaming us for that debt, and that they're not going to go away from the force. So mm -hmm. the logical answer would be independence. Now, if we gain independence, I know uh, it's a little shaky because the United States won't come to the table and the Trump will uh, uh, a little afraid to sit down at the table. But if the power that he came together with, the independent meetings, I think we could discuss how uh, the Tidings Act and how that would work in terms of like the federal process, the phase out, the phase in, and you could negotiate the problem. We will be negotiating with South America to bring back the economy to Puerto Rico. But I mean, that, only, that seems to be the only logical answer. Nothing else would work. Yeah, no, I mean, there, 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 there are some, some challenges still, still with independence from the political. And, and also, I mean, the, the local elites are very adept at adapting while maintaining their hold on power. Mm -hmm. and, and to some extent, the federal government can play and has played some kind of a role of putting some brakes on that kind of corruption. Uh, they end up being kind of with federal charges and things like that, even though uh, it, it, it's complicated. And uh, as its own country, uh, uh, um, unless we really have a very strong constitution with strong internal power sharing controls, mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, um, we need to protect against the top sector continuing their stranglehold on the country, whether it's a state, whether it's a commonwealth, or mm -hmm. whether it's independence. So in that sense, I'm kind of uh, agreeing with a lot of your perspective. So we have, we have other people waiting for it. So we, we can stay behind and then keep chatting, okay? Uh, me, I want to make sure some of the panelists have something, and then I have two people who have okay. their hands raised Let for me just say that I wish we could have at least a bad independence uh, plan, but I don't foresee either a uh, statehood plan, uh, independence plan. Uh, they, in my opinion, the United States is convenient for the United States to keep Puerto Rico like it is. And very convenient. I'm very pessimistic. I think it's going to continue like that for years or decades. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes, ma'am. Seventy two, seventy three. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. I, I think that if you take a look at social uh, media, um, you're going to see that Puerto Ricans in general, they're scared of Cuba opening up because, uh, let's put it this way, Cuba is sexy, Puerto Rico is not. Uh, they fear two reasons in Puerto Rico is going to disappear, going to um, more um, um, fetishized uh, places for cheap. Uh, I'm going to say it again, Cuba is sexy to the point that you go to Europe and people hear you're from Puerto Rico, ah, you say you're Cuban, woof, you're in. You know, that's how it happened. And people in Puerto Rico, they have great fear of this opening because 
before the United States took over Puerto Rico and even after Cuba uh, outdid Puerto Rico in every, econ in every uh, economic measurement. I mean, Cuba is a huge country. So I don't think that Puerto Ricans are so much open to uh, uh, integration and they're more like fearing the competition. And for example, this happened with the, uh, with the Dominican Republic, which has overtaken Puerto Rico in tourism when in the 1960s and 70s, Puerto Rico was um, Se, uh, sending expert on how, uh, to the Dominican Republic on how to build your tourist industry. And now Puerto Rico is trying to catch up with the Dominican Republic. So I don't think that Puerto Rico is so much interested in um, um, creating links um, with other countries and worries more about how can they survive these countries rising up. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Anything else? Yes. And you know, I will. I will ask also to that. I want. I want to add to that. That see, when you're a moderator, you get to do this. Um, that your numbers in those last slides of the how the wealth was divided, the inequality. Um, you know, with your twin, with your quintiles, were very similar to the U.S. Right? I mean, they were almost exact: eight percent, one percent. So I wonder if you could say more about that when you when you deal with with this question. There's actually more inequality in Puerto Rico. The take, the take is about 5% more for the top group. 5%? Yeah, by four or five if you, if you include the top 40. Um, so, there's, so there's more inequality in Puerto Rico. Um, in terms of the, the xenophobia question, um, I have not seen a lot of direct evidence, and maybe others have, that the crisis in Puerto Rico has taken on a kind of xenophobic, anti-Dominican turn. The patterns of prejudice have been pretty negative and stable against that population. I don't think it's gotten worse, but again, I'm not in that community enough to know whether in fact things have, have, have gotten worse and people are being blamed. It would be curious and completely wrong to blame quote-unquote immigrants in Puerto Rico for the problem, A, because they're a very tiny percent of the population, and B, because when you look at their numbers, participation, and all of that, they integrate themselves into the labor market fairly effectively. Uh, um, now, I think Puerto Ricans do punch down, though. And, uh, uh, and that has a color component and a, and a within Puerto Rico race component in the sense that the lower classes tend to be darker than the upper classes. And, 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 and there is definitely 
this kind of, in, in, in this argument uh, that, that is repeated by local Puerto Ricans and local Puerto Rican elites that the welfare is too generous and people don't want to work, there's a, a very strong kind of racial overtone to that uh, uh, um, that isn't explicit, but it's very uh, uh, much there and, and, and it's very implicit. Uh, 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 and it may find a kind of expression that is a racialized expression, uh, uh, um, but I think that the, the, the expression that people in Puerto Rico use to refer to that social group is la gente de los barrios, la gente de los caserío. Caserío. Mm -hmm. And that I think groups kind of race, class, undesirability together in one big stereotype, that that I think is the punching bag for, for the Puerto Rican elites as they're, as they're trying to deviate attention from their own thievery and misdeeds. Um, Puerto Rico is becoming, uh, uh, um, as, as my colleague Raul Figueroa, who's a local demographer, calls it an elder's colony. An elder's colony. The, the average population is aging. Uh, there's more return migration of retirees. Incidentally, quite like Cuba, by the way, who's also experiencing an aging population and are now scrambling to figure out whether they can get retirees to retire from the U.S. with their social security there and they're offering nice villas y castillas, but that's another story. Um, so, the, so the Puerto Rico's becoming uh, somewhat of an elder population. With more out migration, you have the negative side, which is that the market shrinks, that you lose people with experience, creativity, work capacity, uh, 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 people that are you, the country has invested in educating and are now reaping those rewards kind of elsewhere. Um, that would be kind of the, the market shrinks, right? There's less consumers, there's less earners. Uh, 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 but it is a, a safety valve, and it's people that are deciding not to stay and, and put up with that collapsing economy and labor market and looking to, to better themselves, which has a direct positive impact not just on themselves but on their family members. Because rather than them being a financial burden for friends and relatives, they become an asset and, and they send remittances back, which in, are not like Mexico level remittances in Puerto Rico, but they're not trivial either. It's over a billion dollars that is sent back. And many of you that may have family, relatives, and friends in Puerto Rico, you know that sometimes you gotta cover this for your mom or that over here. And the fact that you have an earning capacity makes you more, more likely to do that. So it's a mixed, it's a mixed blessing, you know? It's, 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 uh, 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 um, I don't think anyone gets up from one day to the next and, and wants to kind of migrate, you know? But, 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 the, but for the last, 70 years, the Puerto Rico's economic model has been one that's been predicated and built upon migration and, and counts on that migration to, 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 to be both a political social escape valve and to be an economic, an economic resource. Uh, 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 and I don't see any forces that are stopping it. I think quite the contrary. The worse things get in Puerto Rico, the more people that previously would not even explore leaving are now forced to have to think about living at least for a period of time. I have a couple of friends that actually live in Puerto Rico to this day and work in New York City. And they travel every week, every couple of weeks and basically stay in, in, in one bedroom, you know, one bedroom, they rent a room from somebody. Um, because they're kind of even better off that way, if you can imagine it. Uh, 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 um, so migration is going to continue. And um, the problem is that we don't have a diaspora here that's willing and ready to organize and receive our compatriots. So we then become dispersed and then become this atomized collection of Puerto Ricans here that are not really working to try to get our voice together and our act together to kind of help the island get it together. And, and, and we kind of more say, well, our situation's fixed. We're solved. We can... <laughs> Um, so I, I'm, I'm for more organized, more, more, more powerful, more, more assertive uh, diaspora because I don't see there are any internal forces of change. You know, the political parties in Puerto Rico and the local elites have too much invested in the game as is to, to want to transform it. And the very people that in other countries would be the social force uh, to, to create social movements and put pressure uh, migrate. 
you know? So there, there's, there, so there are a couple of escape valves in Puerto Rico that have prevented a social explosion. I don't believe that things have to get worse to get better, but that a camp is getting more and more adherence in Puerto Rico. In other words, there are more and more people in Puerto Rico saying, this is going to hit bottom, and when it hit, hit, hits bottom, it's going to hit the fan, and maybe at that point, people will wake up. Mm. Uh, um, but maybe not. That's my, my fear, you know. Um, Any, that's if, an optimistic way to end. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just about to say, how about some concluding uh, thoughts from either Harry or Ismael and Hector at the end, too? Well, um, <clears throat> Uh, I would like to say that I, I think that uh, in the near future, um, even more than that, Puerto Rico is not going to become an independent country for many reasons, many, many reasons. Uh, recently, the New York Times came um, and some other uh, media in the U.S. came in support of independence as a uh, 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 fixer-upper, and... There's many problems with that approach. For one, it doesn't take into consideration that the majority of Puerto Ricans who live in Puerto Rico are rejecting independence. And though I don't oppose independence, I would oppose an independence that is imposed on the Puerto Ricans as opposed to offering or negotiating an independence that is workable and that Puerto Ricans are going to accept, not that it's going to be um, uh, put down their throats. Because... Um, it's kind of like um, the ultimate um, colonial act to do such a thing. And the way I see it is part of why privilege for the New York Times and other outlets to say, yeah, let's give Puerto Ricans independence without consulting the Puerto Ricans. That's my view. Not that I oppose independence, but I would oppose someone that basically has uh, someone having... Um, kindergarten knowledge of history of Puerto Rico and the historical background of Puerto Rico offering independence as a solution to the economic problem, which it is an economic problem which is rooted in the political situation of Puerto Rico. But let's tackle what we need to tackle first. There's a health uh, crisis in Puerto Rico and there's an economic crisis that needs to be solved right now. And even if we start working on developing an independent uh, an independence, that would be workable for Puerto Rico is going to take decades. And the economy has to be fixed now. Thank you. Uh, when are things going to hit bottom? Uh, I remember in 2008, uh, in a family uh, reunion during Christmas, people talking about... Uh, the economic situation in Puerto Rico and how it was really bad and hoping for the better in the following elections in 2008 and still it's 2015 and tomorrow there's gonna be something new <laughs> with uh, what the, the current administration unveils. Um, so I don't foresee things uh, getting better. Um, I foresee things getting even worse in the next couple of years. Uh, uh, the vulture funds uh, are going to keep uh, mounting pressure on the government of the island. Uh, we are going to see probably another uh, different administration in the following elections. Uh, the pro statehood party is going to probably win. Uh, and uh, it's going to keep been the same uh, for a while. Uh, and one of the reasons that uh, I worked with Teresita to uh, create this, this panel was in his response to one article in the New York Times that argued that, you know, the, the, the situation in Puerto Rico, uh, it was just a matter of uh, people uh, in this region that can migrate to the United States and that they have a healthy safety net. And this was said by a, by a distinguished professor from the CUNY Graduate Center uh, without considering the political status of Puerto Rico. And uh, my aim here was that people could learn and hear that is 
that the political status of Puerto Rico is key to understand the economic situation of Puerto Rico. But again, I don't foresee any offer from the Congress or the president about solving the political status of Puerto Rico. Sorry for the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Hector, any last thoughts? Um, um, a, a couple uh, real quickly. I think in terms of the research and the analytics, there's a need to continue as these reports and pronouncements come out, to continue to interrogate them and ask, what is the evidence? The minimum wage is too high, but what is the evidence? Puerto Ricans don't want to work. Well, what is the evidence? And, and I see part of my job as continuing to interrogate. And again, I was shocked when, 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 when I realized how little original research Kruger had done. And I was shocked as a Puerto Rican, not because she wasn't Puerto Rican or anything, but because you figure, you know, at least you're going to do your homework and try to get it. And the same problem that happened to, 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 to our colleague Krugman from, from here and, and others who uh, are used to giving things a superficial look and thinking that they get it all. And Puerto Rico is not an easy place or case to understand. It's actually very challenging. Independence, everybody can understand, and statehood, everybody can understand, but, but colonies are are complicated entities. <laughs> and, and I think Puerto Rico is not a simple place with simple solutions. And I don't think complexity should be our enemy, but I think we should continue to interrogate those stereotypes that I pointed out, with, 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 which are very present. I, right now, worry less about the status conversation, eh? because there are a lot of smart, powerful, thoughtful, engaged people that are in that debate. And I don't think I can contribute much to that, but I do think I can contribute with the research skills and others to understand poverty and inequality in Puerto Rico, what it is, uh, its causes, what are not its causes, and its consequences, and to ensure that any policy that is proposed, whether independence, statehood, commonwealth, whether populares or the PNPs, <coughs> any policy that attempts against the livelihood uh, 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 of low-income people in Puerto Rico, I'm going to oppose. And I don't care where it's coming from. I don't care what color it's coming from. I don't care what you call it. I will look at the policy, and if I think it's going to hurt working people and poor people in Puerto Rico, because it's going to cut away benefits that I believe they have a right to as U.S. citizens, to food, to health care, to housing, I'm going to do the best I can to find the data, find the evidence, and, 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 and articulate why uh, 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 helping is not hurting, but helping is actually helping. Uh, 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 and that those that say helping are hurting do so because they either don't want to pay or because they have some other agenda in mind that is in the interest of, 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 of those people. Um, at the broader level, I am frustrated with my compatriots in the U.S. because I think that we love our country, we love our island, and. We love its idiosyncrasies, and, but, but we have not really been good and disciplined at organizing ourselves as a diaspora and, and, and being more forceful about how the U.S., where we live, treats our island and how it should treat it. And I think we sh if we were a, 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 a common tight force, uh, uh, we could, uh, as a community, negotiate whatever independence, whatever reform, commonwealth, whatever statehood we want. But because we're atomized and divided and, 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 and really haven't made an effort to politically come together and do a, a project for Puerto Rico as opposed to a project for statehood or a project for independence, the divide and conquer is going to, to continue. And I'll finish with, with, with this last thought. The Centro in, in, revolutionized the way people think about Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican history. Uh, 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 and it made a lot of arguments that, that really changed the way we think about migration and the role that migration played and how it wasn't an accident but was fundamental to Puerto Rican history. But it also made an argument that, 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 that went something like this and it said, traditionally it's been said that Puerto Rico is where it is because Puerto Ricans haven't decided what they want to do. And yes, there's a lot to that. We haven't come together to decide what we want to do. But Congress hasn't decided what it wants to do either. And the U.S. hasn't decided what it wants to do. Mm -hmm. And the master has the cards. And Puerto Rican indecision is fomented by American indecision. 
Puerto Rican indecision is convenient to American indecision. And if you notice, when uh, one of the segments in Puerto Rico starts getting more and more popular, somehow there's some kind of federal investigation or some kind of something that chops mm -hmm. their legs down and down they go and the other ones start coming up. But if the other ones start getting to, do you hear some congressmen or some representatives saying, oh, but if Puerto Rico becomes a state, everybody's gonna have to learn English tomorrow. And they start with that sing and dance and then the popularity of statehood goes down. Mm -hmm. So rather than, than I think where we are being a simple matter of Puerto Rican indecision and us as a family not coming together and deciding, which I've argued, and I think it's true, I think we also need to keep our eyes on, 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 on the bigger prize machinations and, and manipulations and incompetence in the U.S. Congress and at some point also demand that they decide what they want to do with Puerto Rico and stop playing this game of uh, uh, carrots and sticks with the different political parties in the island to ensure that none of them really has an outright majority so that they don't have to sit and negotiate with a united Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it sounds conspiratorial, conspiratorial and a little uh, Machiavellian and a little uh, 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 discouraging, but uh, the solution in my sense to all of the challenges is in continuing forums like this and occasions for us to come together, share some analysis, leave home with a, hopefully a, a, a different, deeper understanding and a sense that this thing is not gonna solve itself, nor are the Americans gonna solve it for us. Uh, 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 um, it's gotta be about us uh, uh, coming together and then demanding that the Americans put their cards on the table too mm -hmm. and say, this is what we're willing to do with Puerto Rico. But in a negotiation, you know that you don't wanna reveal your cards. So I understand why it's a, it's a as, 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 as Ismael said, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easier game to say, you all decide and then we'll tell you what we, would, we can do. And they're the master. They, they have the power to do that. We don't have the power to impose anything on them. But as a diaspora, I think we should organize to demand that the, that the U.S., more clarity from the U.S. and, 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 and less, less of this kind of a, a, a beneficial obscurantism. And I thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, 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 um, it's... It, it's when one sits and does a lot of tables and a lot of data at 2 or 3 a.m. at night, one hopes and wishes that someone at least looks at it and appreciates it. So thank you again for being here, for being so supportive. Thank you for being here. Thank you to Hector and Harry and Ismael for doing this, to Victoria Stone, who put all of the details together. And stay tuned because we will do this again. Thank you. Good night. We did good, man. Yeah. Started on time, ended on time. <laughs> I like the way you do business. Ah, so we made you need to have to do it again. That was awesome. I can send you a slide deck for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. I can pop up for you anywhere. Oh my lad. Nice. Because, because this uh, this uh, yeah. Oops. Oh, yeah. Could you come to the other one? To the other one. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Okay, no, 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 Do this. this is probably 